Hey, Internets. So there was a really interesting article on Aporia magazine about how there is a good deal of evidence to suggest that we are, in fact, ruled by midwits. Or, in other words, people who, while not necessarily dumb, are certainly not as smart as they think they are, and as smart as they would like others to think they are. It turns out many people in positions of elite authority who we would normally assume to be intelligent are, in fact, incapable of a lot of basic things you would expect a smart person quotation marks, to be able to do, like general statistical math and reasoning we all learned in high school. And one of the side effects of having too many incompetent people behind the decision-making wheel is that you end up with a world where there are some demonstrably stupid things that can be easily disproven with readily available evidence, or in some cases just basic reasoning alone. And yet these very stupid things are unironically taught to the masses as fact anyways. And that's what this video is going to be about. I'd like to start my first rant video of the year going over some of the dumbest things that are currently driving clown world towards its absolute state of permanent clownery. Some of the beliefs and behaviors that, while practiced by many people in what you'd consider an elite position, don't actually make any sense whatsoever. Some of these are things I've mentioned before, and some of them are things I plan to go into more detail in the future. Regardless, this video is pretty much just going to be a extremely condensed overview of some of the most damaging lies that are often taught as truth. I'll start with one I've briefly covered before in my video on white privilege, which is not knowing that intersectionality concludes an individualism, and that intersectionality when properly understood is in fact one of the greatest refutations of modern woke critical theory in an epic moment of self-own. In case you don't know, intersectionality is the idea that people's various social and political identities, various aspects of themselves, result in the creation of these unique oppressions. In other words, different combinations of the groups that you belong to result in unique challenges for yourself that are very different from people who belong to a different combination of groups, in a way that is different from people who belong to only one group, where you see Woketoids sort of assigning different levels of oppression to themselves based on what their sexual identity is, or their gender is, or their ethnicity is, or their class, or their religion, or how tall, or how short they are, and blah blah blah, and age, and pretty much whatever other identities they can come up with. So for example, a trans feminist person of color goes through various challenges and benefits in life that they would not go through if they were just trans or just a person of color. And to some degree, that is completely true. Different aspects of who you are, and how you view yourself in relation to how the world views you, will completely change how you deal with life, as well as how everything else deals with you. And these components of your identity and experiences in life can be divided even further. Like, for instance, if you got your wallet stolen at some point in your life, or if you were constantly bullied or socially rejected some way by others around you while you were growing up due to having some eccentric personality or something wrong with your face or various, various things, or if you grew up poor and then became rich, or if you grew up rich and then lost it all, or if you somehow bounced up and down the socioeconomic totem pole a few times, whatever you went through. Every aspect of yourself and your experiences intersects with other aspects of yourself to create challenges that are unique to, well, you. The individual. But of course, when intersectionality is described by a woke toid, they're not going to describe it to you this way. What they do is they arbitrarily decide to stop their calculation of a person's intersecting components of their identity and who they are at extremely basic surface level things like, again, gender or religion, instead of pushing it to the correct logical conclusion of individualism. Because by stopping it at those surface level base identity groups, they can then pretend to make their case for equitable identity politics, which is really really, really dumb, because what they're doing here is like working through a complex mathematical equation and then arbitrarily stopping halfway because going further would disprove the theory that they're working on. It's basically an extremely convoluted special pleading fallacy. The reality is, intersectionality is not proof of critical theory at all. It is actually proof of Anne Rand's theory that the individual is the smallest unit of measure in human individuals. Yeah, it's um, kind of obvious when you put it like that, isn't it? And yet, intersectionality is often taught in Ivy League universities, by the way, as a component of CRT, despite the fact that intersectionality is a refutation of CRT when understood in its totality. Another thing that is somewhat related to this is the belief that colorblindness is racist. Intersectionality can be used to trap any leftist who says this by simply asking them the question, do you believe in collective guilt? If they say no, they have contradicted themselves since being against colorblindness requires you to be an ethnic collectivist, and if you believe in one side of the collectivist equation, you must eventually submit to the other. And if they say yes and actually admit that they believe in collective guilt, then you just explain to them how intersectional theory actually disproves anti-individualism, which is always pretty funny because watching wokes get disproven by their own theories is always fun. Genuinely, it never gets old. So the next one I want to talk about is the disturbing belief in blank slateism. So science kind of has an internal struggle going on right now. A lot of people working in soft sciences tend to believe that blank slateism is true, or 
they'll say things that assume that blank slateism is true, whereas a lot of people who work in hard sciences that actually study these things, like genetic research and hereditary research, will say, no, blank slateism is definitely not true. Now, for those who don't know, blank slateism is the belief that a man is born as equals in a state of tabula rasa, or a blank mental slate, that everything else is learned by interacting with the environment, that a person's intellectual ability and IQ and whatnot and aspects of our identities are all decided later in life as a result of events after we are born. In other words, it's the whole extreme nurture response. Blank slateism is often held as a belief by a lot of pseudo-intellectual elites because it lets them preach equality and utopia. If we human beings just had the right environment, if we all just had infinite good stuff and infinite kindness, then one day maybe all humans will achieve the status of becoming a 300 IQ omnibalevolent turbo angel and we'll all be riding magical unicorns. Okay, I'm being a little uncharitable to the blank slateism here and exaggerating some of the silly things people who believe in it say because, well, blank slateism has been pretty roundly debunked which is really strange, considering how many people still believe in it. It's basically flat-earthism at this point. Those who study genetics and the heritability of certain behaviors have been publishing study after study after study, with replication after replication after replication over the last 30 to 40 years or so that shows that no, the idea that mankind shares this equality in blankness is just, well, not true. It's just not a thing. And this suggests that either A, a lot of who we are is mostly just decided on a genetic level, and that a lot of our experiences driven by instinctual factors instead, or B, that there's some conscious rationality to us that makes up who we are, or a soul if you could call it that, which just doesn't really change throughout our lives, or perhaps it's a combination of these things or more. Probably the biggest nail in the coffin though for the blank slate copers is that twin studies exist where the twins are separated at birth. One particular bombshell showing that identical twins raised apart had roughly the same expression of similar temperament and personality traits as twins raised together. I'll say that again just for emphasis. Identical twins, separated at birth, raised apart, had roughly the same amount of similarities as the twins raised together. So yeah, again, it's pretty safe to say that blank slateism is just not a thing. Which is kind of further proves how ridiculous the equity fallacy is where disparity in outcomes is falsely assumed to imply disparity in treatment, and then used to justify socialism. Which brings me to number three, which is that there's this very interesting link in how belief in equality usually comes packaged with a very poor ability to do qualitative analysis. You see, one problem that comes with belief in equality is that it leads one to think that they can understand the thoughts of others through the light form of solipsism, that is psychological projection, which it, it kind of makes sense, because I mean, if you think everyone's the same, then you would think that you can just guess what other people's thoughts are by looking at yourself. But of course, the problem is that doesn't actually work, so this results in them coming to some pretty silly conclusions. I'll just use the gender pay gap as an easy, quick example. The pay gap is explained entirely by innate differences between men and women that leads to the sex as having very different goals in life, with different incentives in life, with the biggest of these differences being how our biology incentivizes us to make very different choices if we wish to get married and start a family. This is why when you account for those choices and account for both marital status and having children, the wage gap not only completely goes away, but actually reverses a little bit and you see that women actually earn slightly more to the dollar. But of course, people who believe in equality have a hard time seeing this because they assume these differences don't exist, and thus they instead fall back on the discrimination hypothesis. They think that, oh well, men and women are equal, therefore we see this difference, therefore mud discrimination. They don't actually provide evidence for this hypothesis, of course. What they do instead is account for a small handful of 3 to 10 variables to make it look like they've conducted a study in good faith, and then assert that the leftover unknowns must be due to discrimination because, again, they believe in mud equality, and then they immediately shift the burden of proof away from themselves. Which, again, makes no sense because blank slateism has been roundly debunked. And yet numerous journalists and numerous politicians and numerous academics and a lot of elites in very significant positions of power preach this nonsense as true. Despite the fact that not only has the reasoning been de refuted, but the underlying foundation beneath it has also been debunked. Yeah, it's pretty bad. Anyway, I'll just move on to number four, which kind of leading from the subject of feminism since I've talked about the pay gap, it would be that for some really weird reason, we see it as culturally acceptable to rate the other sex out of 10 when 
women are doing it to men, but when men rate women out of 10, then it's sexist patriarchal beauty standards. Basically, it's the all women are tens mentality, all women are high value. There's no such thing as a low value woman. Only men can be rated on a scale. Only men exist in states of high value and low value. This is one of those things that you would just think is so obviously dumb that it doesn't really need to be disproven. But unfortunately, a large number of people unironically think this way. And a large number of them are in fact academic and political elites. Anyways, the basic problem with it is that women don't really get to decide what men find attractive in other women. Only men can do that. For really the same reason that women get to decide what is attractive in men. Men can't decide what women find attractive, really. I mean, look, it's an obvious double standard fallacy. I don't think I really need to explain why it's incorrect. What's more important is understanding how it got this way, which is that one of the biggest flaws in modern Western liberalism is that it privileges the victim way too hard, to the point where anyone claiming victimhood for whatever reason, even if it's legitimately nothing more than I'm a victim because my feelings, is treated seriously no matter how ridiculous that might be. Loosely related to this is the victim perception fallacy, where people's perceptions that they are a victim is treated as fact, even though there's no actual evidence to back it up. This is definitely worth a place on the list, but I made an entire video of it earlier, so there's no real point in going in it further than I already have. And so thus, in order to avoid subjective hurt feelings, we have adopted a very weird cultural habit of playing pretend in order to make those claiming victim status feel better. Now everyone knows that not all women are tense. Even the wokest intersectional feminista deep down knows that this is a belief that has zero ground in reality. But third wave feminism says that this game of pretend also allows the women who buy into the feminista mindset to all believe that they are entitled to 10 out of 10 high value giga chads. Because hey, I'm a 10, therefore I deserve a 10, and if I don't get it, then well, that's society's fault for not producing enough 10 out of 10 males. Which is ridiculous because men who actually are at the top are not going to just commit to any random women. So we all know it's not actually true. Whether it's dating or economics, there is such a thing as scarcity. And that's kind kind of sad because when you think about it logically, the women who fall for this grift are really only harming themselves. In order to improve oneself, you must first start from a standpoint of humility. You gotta look at yourself and acknowledge that, hey, there's some imperfections within me. I I'm not the greatest thing since sliced bread. I could improve myself. And if you deny this, you're basically saying that you've already reached your max level, which in the case you have not is really nothing short of robbing yourself of your own potential. And yet clown world liberalism is perfectly happy allowing these games to pretend to go on so long as it results in some immediate happy fluffy bunny thoughts. It's unfathomably stupid, and yet we tolerate it anyways because again, many of our midwit elites unironically would rather pat themselves on the back for giving someone good feels even if it's destroying society in the long run. And this is important to understand because you gotta also realize that the root problem behind this actually isn't feminism. This is an issue that you see in all aspects of society right now. For instance, going back to blank slatism. Blank slatism is really, really, really easy to disprove, but it feels good to believe in it because if you believe in it, you think that all problems of inequality can be magically solved by changing the environment. Just give more people more free stuff and the problem will go away. It's not actually true, but again, it feels good to believe in it. Anyways, that's enough for feminism and woke liberalism. Now for something a little bit more controversial and libertarian, which is this belief that because monopolies are bad, we need to give the state a monopoly over multiple aspects of the economy in order to prevent the problems of a monopoly. Yeah. So there's this really weird assumption that if we just have the government solve complex economic problems by giving control of it to an aggressive agent, then that agent will somehow not abuse their monopoly in the way that a privately owned monopoly would for some reason. People just kind of assume that because we live, supposedly anyways, in a liberal democracy, that we could just vote any politician out if they abuse their power. But we know this isn't true. This almost never happens in practice. Voters keep corrupt, crappy politicians in office cycle after cycle all the freaking time. And they do this because, well, voters do not make rational decisions. Voters have regularly proven that they do not give the same mental weight to the vast majority of positions that they give to their own personal financial goals. And so wasteful dingbats sit in positions of government authority all the time while using it to line their pockets on your dime. I, I, I did not mean that to rhyme there. <laughs> Anyway, the most obvious example of this is that uh, probably deserves its own video one day would be the FDA, or the Food and Drug Administration. So the FDA is a pathetic storm of corruption. On paper, they're supposed to protect American consumers from poor quality food and drugs and whatnot, and ensure that things are all up to standards with what you'd expect from, you know, a first world, supposedly healthy country. But what the FDA actually does is create medical monopolies and accept bribes to make a very long story short. What's especially weird about the FDA is that we know for a 
fact that private companies providing the exact same service would prop up if the FDA were to be abolished, because many of them already exist. You look at a lot of aspects of these industries that the FDA does not touch, then you actually do see private companies already providing a lot of certs. For example, there exist private certifications for GMO-free food and organic certifications as well. Getting rid of the FDA wouldn't get rid of the fact that people want their food and drugs to be safe, and thus more private companies would come in to fill the gap because there'd be money there because people would be willing to pay more for better quality food and drugs, and grocery store owners and pharmacists know this, and they know that that better quality will lead to better sales. In fact, considering how bad of a job the FDA does, not having the FDA would actually make these things safer in the long run, since the FDA's monopoly and regulation has often failed to spot obvious problems. Having multiple private companies do the job instead would allow for more than one check to exist down the pipeline in order to ensure safety since producers could potentially get certified by multiple companies instead of just, you know, the FDA. The next failure of Clown World is this fusion of French criticism of modernism with leftist progressivism into radical postmodernist philosophy. The TLDR of postmodernism is that it's a word soup generator that tries to reject the use of logic, reason, and objective truth whenever it disagrees with regressive leftist narratives, by basically calling everything they don't like a social construct and hand-waving facts they don't like away as relative. For example, a radical postmodernist might unironically say something like, Western science is a tool of oppression by the cis-white male heteropatriarchy in order to hand wave away some of those studies I mentioned earlier in regards to blank slatism. The problem this philosophy has is that this entirely hinges on its ability to actually disprove objective truth which no postmodernist has ever done. What they do instead is try to deconstruct the concept of what objective truth is by nitpicking at things like how people are unable to tell what media is telling the truth and what isn't, therefore hyperrealism is taking over and cultural relativism is king. The obvious problem with this is that it doesn't actually disprove objective truth. All that proves is that people aren't very good at figuring out what truth is. Glad we had the postmodernists to explain that one to us. It's kind of like when one of those guys is smoking a bong and says, hey man, if you can't tell the difference between an acid trip and reality, then maybe the acid trip is the reality, and this world we live in is all a hallucination, man. Wow, man. Except with significantly more effort put into things to make it sound more academic, and fused with a social justice cause so they can just falsely accuse anyone who criticizes them of being a bigot. Postmodernism thus rests on a personal incredulity fallacy where it confuses human limitations to comprehend and agree upon reality for evidence that objective reality doesn't exist. This is ridiculous. And yes, I'm aware that I'm massively oversimplifying this. There's a lot more to it, and there's a lot more counter arguments to go over in regards to it. I'll probably do a full video on this someday, TM, especially in regards to the paper by Crenshaw. The reason I include it in this list is because it's pretty easy to understand on its surface why postmodernist philosophy doesn't actually work or make sense. They don't actually have any real good proof of their main central claim. And for that reason, most people are pretty safe with just ignoring it entirely. But anyways, the last thing I want to go over is another one of those ideas that bleeds into the equity fallacy, which is the claim that meritocracy doesn't exist, which bread tube pseudo-intellectuals really tend to love this particular clownism, so I figured it would be a good one to end this video on. The problem with their claims against meritocracy is that it rests on a flawed understanding of what meritocracy actually is which I can't really blame people for since Wikipedia is somewhat guilty of spreading it. Anyways, meritocracy is incorrectly portrayed as the idea that everyone is rewarded according to their individual effort and skill. And of course, their argument against this is that it isn't a real thing, because some people are born into more supportive environments. For example, if two kids study very hard to get into an Ivy League school, and one kid is from a poor family and the other kid is from a rich family, and the poor kid doesn't get in because he didn't have access to the exact same resources, then this is not true meritocracy because it's not a fair game game, it's not a level playing field. And there are two major issues with this. First is that meritocracy isn't actually about fairness. What meritocracy really means is that the best person for the job or role should get that role. How exactly that person became the best person for said job or role is irrelevant to meritocracy. This may sound uncaring at first until you realize that the alternative is much worse. It's usually government regulation and quotas designed to ensure that the best person for the job doesn't always get the job for the sake of appeasing some arbitrary feel-goodism, at least until the competency crisis hits. The second problem goes back to the issue of intersectionality. It's not actually that easy to determine who had an easier time. For instance, what if the rich kid in the previous example had abusive and unloving parents to the point where it was actually much harder than if he had been born poor in the same situation as the poor kid? 
What if the diversity team working in admissions was primarily concerned with ethnicity and socioeconomic status, and he just barely missed the cutoff line because they determined he was too privileged? That's the problem with trying to equate along the lines of intersectional identity politics. You can potentially create more equal-looking outcomes on the collective-looking scale, but it can come at the cost of creating the very unfairness that they were trying to solve at the individual scale. So it's impossible to know for sure which disparities were truly the result of unequal opportunity and which were due to innate differences by using the leftist version of intersectionality that stops at arbitrary surface level identity groups. Anyways, that's it for this video. There were a few others I could have gone over, but I think it's best I'll just save them for the future. So thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like, subscribe, share, or dip me on Ko-Fi, or leave a comment for the algorithm and all that good stuff. Till next time.